I came back from the conference in America and I sat there during the conference and my face fell. There was a succession of Japanese scientists got up one after another. And they were doing what we were doing. They were students. You know, and that's always the fear of the scientists. And I came back full of self-righteousness and I called about the meeting. So I said, we've got to beat these Japanese. <laughs> they're beating us. There's guys in Osaka, there's guys in Tokyo. Why is everybody coming in at 7.30 a.m.? You sure we're here at 5.00 today? <laughs> and about a week later, we Christmas out. We had one every year for a lot. Went to a nice restaurant. I went to the toilet, you know, during the meal. Came back, and this is what they were doing. Especially when the toilet, like, Torch, is Torch here? Torch here somewhere. She's hiding. <laughs> Coach Tony is a very important person in my life. She's our lab manager. Right? And she's on song because lab managers are at home the whole time doing the hard work, organizing the lab. They never go on public places, they don't spawn around the world. So big thanks to Coach actually over the years for all the efforts for running my lab and helping me keeping on the side now. She put this together. So she wasn't really like me. I just like that person. They then gave me a calendar, right, each month featuring different images. The first one was this, the arrival of the bus. <laughs> The second one was this, loading a gel, tapping in the side. The third one was, due to massive scale-ups, DNA cracks and everything. And my own favourite, the lab meeting. I got one of this disrespectful thing. It was terrible. Mind you, it was found and picked up the work that we began to beat some of these things. So again, the lab was obsessing. All the weapons tones and how they work and how they signal. And we were lucky enough to find a key probably. The question we always asked was how do they work? We're biochemists, which we get down to the nitty gritty of how things work in biology. That was a question. My lab has worked on a single question for 10 years now. And we were lucky enough uh, to work on a very simple system. <laughs> <laughs> That's how awful it gets, right? <laughs> but we found one of the tiles. That's what's exciting here. We found a thing called MAL, one of the key tiles that gets pushed over by itself. And I can't really convey the excitement of that. Find a brand new piece. And MAL is one of these key tiles. If you get rid of MAL, nothing falls over. And that was a, bit, that was a big breakthrough for our lab. We published that in 2001. But the story I want to tell you is, uh, began about uh, three, four years ago now, when I went over to Oxford to give a talk. And again, science is all about that. It's collaboration, it's swimming around the world, meeting people. And I was over in Oxford, and I got talking to the writer Adrian Hill. And he's a genesis. And he began looking at the male gene, and this is the subject of the male gene here. He showed there were two male genes in human, right? And then you often see that, you know, slight, slight differences in the gene. We all have two copies of every gene, one from the mother, one from the father. It turns out there were two types of genes for male. One we call S180 and the other L180. Horrible names, I know, but that, they were the two genes. So you might inherit an S from your father and an S from your mother. You might get an L from your father or an L from your mother, or you might get an S or an L. They're the three genius types we call it. Every gene is like that, those two copies, right? And they were the options. You know, I didn't was interested in I said, yes, let's work on these together. We then discovered that the L was inactive and the S was active, and that was interesting. There was one active form and one inactive form. But a long story short, we made a breakthrough because of AVA. AVA had loads of clinical samples, you had malaria samples, you had TB samples. And it turns out that the place to be, if you want to fight malaria, it's to be in the middle. One series from one parent and a loose from the other, that gives the best signal and that's optimal for fighting it. If you're double series, you get much more disease. And if you're double loose, you get much more disease as well. The reason for this is the series is active, the loose is inactive. So double series is a strong signal. And many people who die of malaria are dying of an overactive immune response. So that's not the place to be. Those who two loose scenes, they're not doing well, they're not saying at all, and they die of an overactive immune response. So we discovered the place to be is in the middle. It's called the heterozygous state. And in fact, the Goldilocks effect is a good way to describe it. Not too hot, which is double series. Not too cold, double loose scene, in the middle. Heterozygous is the place to be. And look at this. Tell you know. If you can, people who've inherited one type of mammal from one parent and from the other are protected against all these diseases. Now, what's true of that was? We found this in a test tube in my lab almost. You know, we, we didn't work on that yet. And yet, Adrian had the clinical samples and he was in the Gambia to link this into human disease. That's the biggest clue that you can do that with your discoveries. You know, you Gambia, Vietnam, the head of his life had a five fold decrease risk of severe malaria. There was a Vietnamese group, uh, there was a Kenyan group, there was a UK group in pneumonia. All of them had half the risk of developing these diseases if they were head of his life from out. And then recently, we've done stuff on a Dutch group. If you're a Lucy homozygous, you have a much more severe course for sepsis. 
But this was great because it made this protein in the eye relevant to our immune systems. We then uh, discovered, of course, that there's a big literature on this, and what I'm talking about here is whether inheritability is a feature of infectious diseases. Can you inherit from your parents a risk of dying of an infection? And you can. There's a big literature on this. So it turns out, like, like many other things, we inherit this susceptibility from our parents. And Louis Pasteur, the family father of much of what we do, actually, was very aware of this. Three of his children died of typhoid. 189, 182, 183, and that spurred him to work on the immune system. Be about the rabies vaccine, for instance, and be about pasteurization. So it was kind of known that this susceptibility was inherited. We then wondered where did this come from, this extra form of matter? I mean, did it evolve? What does it mean? Obviously, evolution was selected out because if we had those eyes, we you're not going to die, you have more children, and the, the gene might persist. And this study is a really good example of, again, the fascination of science. The guys in Holland, we had samples from all over the world, right? And these are all representative of different ethnic groups. And we could look at the different types of man in these, the, the three different genotypes. types. So in Europe, for instance, about a third of us are the right type, where it where kind of is one series, one leucine. A lot of people are double series. Here's Arvin, Kim, Pelagandi. Very interestingly, the Chinese are all double series, too hot, right? There's an Aboriginal group here, where it's too hot as well. The uh, Trio Indians from Central America, they're too hot. Right, they got the whole series. And um, in Africa, there's an increasing number, we think, of the heterozygous, the ones with Syrian and we see. There's a group in India, but like the Europeans, and there's a group in the Middle East, these are a group of Bedouins in the Middle East, who are descended from the original people in the Middle East. They've got a third, a third, a third. Now, for instance, that's a fascinating result, that difference. Now, why do I say that? It's because we can pinpoint when this first arose. These are all representative of the ancestral people who went to live in these places. And it begs the question where the Homo sapiens come from. We've got to wonder the origin of humans to explain this result. And we know that humans first arose around about 200,000 years ago, so when Homo sapiens arose. Again, the power of science. Um, we were the first species of chimp then. We're descended from a very small number of humans, maybe as few as 100, living around about that time. Our first example of real modern humans is about 70,000 years ago. This thing called inventiveness happens. And like last week in nature, they covered this really interesting paper. There was a change probably in the voice box gene 70,000 years ago. It allowed us to transmit information vocally to each other. And that gave us a big leap up compared to chimpanzees. So this is all agreed now. And that's a wonderful breakthrough, I think. That must be the ultimate question. Where did we come from? We're descended from 100 humans. And then a few genetic changes then give rise to modern humans. Of course, if you're a Scientologist, you believe the intergalactic emperor is here. <laughs> what is the famous word? 75 million years ago, very different volcanoes, only to reemerge to an animal human. That could be correct. Couldn't it? Science. Maybe someone will find that out. I don't know. Science does not make judgments. These people, we might think of them as not jobs, but they can prove it, we have to believe them. Yeah. At the moment, science agrees on this, this through here. Now, because of that, we can predict when this mountain gene arose. And this is the history of humans, in case you want to see it. 130,000 years ago we leave Africa, 100,000 years ago we're in the Middle East, 67,000 years ago a family, probably a very small number, moved to Asia. All of the uh, Aborigines and the Native Americans are descended from that group. Around about 40,000 years ago some of us moved into Europe, and around about 10,000 years ago we moved to Ireland. The founder of the European population is similar to the Indian population, and that's an important fact. So what we can say then is this, originally, this is another paper, these are all different racial groups here, starting in Africa, getting to the Middle East and Europe. Everybody was double series to begin with. It arose in the Middle East, and that founder fell with the European and Indian populations about 8,000 years ago, and that was after they left for Asia. Okay? So in other words, before this leucine form arose, people had left in the to Asia. It was after that that the leucine form arose. Probably with farming, farming began to increase infectious diseases. So we can conclude from this that it arose about 8,000 years ago. And that again is the power of science that will give us that. And one example of this is when Columbus finally went to America, it was a family reuniting after 67,000 years. <laughs> because remember, they got off to Asia 67,000 years ago. Right? Eventually Columbus went and met them in America. And this is one reason we think why they died of infections, because the Europeans at that stage have a mix of Syria and Lucy. These are still double Siri, much more at risk of dying of infection. And that can be one reason why infectious diseases wiped out some of the Americans. And again, who would have thought that studies on the fruit fly and our flies would be rise to understanding of human history? The power of science again coming in there very importantly. What we can say then is from all this, and that little snapshot of my own lab, these are very important molecules for resistance to infection. We know that from all our studies. We know 